Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor AJ Espinosa. We're reading through the entire Bible together, book by book, chapter by chapter. Oh, here we are in Revelation chapter 14 now. Uh, this just a really cool string of, of uh, just powerful imagery, uh, mysterious, some cryptography. We saw last time the number 666. Well, today we've got the number 144,000. So, uh, you know, we're doing a little bit of math in the midst of our uh, biblical interpretation today. <laughs> uh, and so uh, here we are looking at this 144,000 and we get three more angels into the mix and we get the word Babylon thrown in here too. And you might be scratching your head saying like, hang on a second, what? Like, I thought we were saying that this had to do with, with Rome and with Jerusalem and now we're, what's Babylon? this is like a, a metaphor um, but the question is who for <laughs> that's what we'll be talking about today I, and today joining us we have as our guest we've got pastor nate ruback pastor at grace chapel lutheran church fontaine neighbors missouri good morning brother good to have you back with us and for this chapter in revelation too yeah good morning how are you doing uh, doing all right, uh, you know, uh, just trying to day by day, making things work in the the new normal for the time. You know, it's kind of you, you kind of wait a little bit on bated breath. You know, when the governor starts talking, you're like, oh, do we do we get to come out and play or <laughs> but, uh, such as such as things are? Uh, how about over there in Bellefontaine neighbors? Oh, we're we're doing well. Today is a beautiful day outside. You know, I. I, like you said, it's the new normal. I, I think everybody's been thrust into, you know, learning how to do things remotely, uh, you know, online. How do we educate our kids? You know, I, I think we're we're dealing with the same things everybody else is. And the beauty about it is, is our God is still the same, and and we will continue to press on. Right. Yeah. And, and press on. We we shall with uh, with Revelation here and in Revelation 14. Um, you know, it, it is interesting how you, you, you kind of just keep getting more numbers here. We've got I mentioned already the hundred and forty four thousand. So it's just, you know, OK, we had six, six, six. Now we get one hundred and forty four thousand. Um, and then at the very end of it, too, we even get, um, you know, sixteen hundred stadia. Right, yeah. which that's not just a number, but a unit of measure. So we've got we've got a lot of things to kind of break down here. Uh, a lot of a lot of good stuff, though. I mean, like it, it really goes into some detail here with this 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 idea of the contrast between uh, the beast on the one hand and then the lamb on the other. Yeah, it's really um, well. It's step back. I think the last time we were on, we we began talking about the four horsemen. When you and I were together last, and oh uh, uh, yeah, 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 it, it's really a neat movement now to what is seen within those four horsemen to kind of a culmination and a transition of what's happening between what we learn in twelve and thirteen to this kind of transitional chapter, and then what happens then in fifteen, and and there is just there's so much imagery and so many different uh, details and markings in fourteen that. I mean, we could spend a month just on 14, breaking down every little point um, that begins yeah. to, oh, yeah. to us. Yeah, Yeah. no, I mean, easily, easily. And, and you're right, too, that these these are some pretty important chapters here. I mean, you, you had the sequence of the seven trumpets, and then we're, we're getting to the sequence of the, the seven bowls, right? Like the, the seven, like, plagues. Plague. And so, uh, you know, between these two sequences, there's a kind of break thing— I want to say let's say break things down because they're still pretty cryptic at this point, but the, the way that they kind of get into to more deep and they're not so um, like serialized. I mean, I mean these these are I think kind of key for helping us understand the rest of it. So no. yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot going on, um, a lot to get through today. A longer chapter in Revelation as far as they go, uh, but uh, yeah, lot, lots of good stuff. Excited to have. To have you back on and we just keep talking about the apocalyptic but we'll <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's good it's good for times like this but absolutely uh all, well, all right well as we get started would you say a prayer for us and for everyone listening along and for all of our brothers and sisters 
Absolutely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is the day that uh, you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. And we thank you for this opportunity to continue to be in your word in the book of Revelation. I pray that in our uh, hour of study today that you would open our hearts and minds to what you teach and continue to lead your children uh, to see and to learn uh, about you uh, and about your son Christ. Lord, I, I pray today and take a moment to um, to pray for all of those who have been affected um, by this this epidemic, uh, for those who have uh, lost their jobs, those who are uh, in the front lines of fighting this, our first responders, our medical uh, personnel. I pray for those all who are sick, who are struggling, um, and I pray that your glory and your peace and the comfort that only uh, you can bring be with each and every one of them. So bless us in our time today as we study your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so let's. Um, so, like we were saying at the beginning, last time we had the two beasts. We saw the one that was from the sea, and yeah, the one that came out of the the earth. Or um, as we kind of started to talk about the, the land, there's um, that ambiguity that kind of always gets us um, in Greek. Uh, and the last thing we got to was that number six six six, and we were talking a little bit about how um, that that seems like that kind of fits with what we've been seeing with all these different connections to the Roman empire. So here we go though, a new number for us to consider. Um, one that I think even if people disagree with, uh, how exactly you get this number, I don't think anybody thinks it refers to the Roman empire at least. Um, <laughs> so here, here we go. The first few verses here of chapter 14 with the 144,000. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like a roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and for the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless." Well, we could just spend a whole month just on these um, five verses. <laughs> Easily. Yeah. yeah and I, oh, yeah, I know. I mean, just take take your pick about what you want to... I mean, there's a, I mean, there, there's the, the nature of the sound. I mean, it's interesting that the sound is described with so much detail, like waters, like thunder, like, like harpists. Mm -hmm. So th there's kind of a lot of description there. But then there's a lot of description, not just on the sound uh, and this kind of mysterious song, this mysterious, like, unlearnable song, um, but then the description of the redeemed, um, who are described as um, undefiled virgins, the first fruits, uh, you know, like, and what, what exactly do you make of that description? So um, I'll, let, I'll let you pick where you want to start here. Well, I think the, the first thing, I, I think, you know, when, when words and stuff and, and details are revealed in Scripture, I think, you know, every word has... Uh, a, a point, you know, that it's not just an ambiguous word meant to fill space. So I think when we look at all of those little details, they all carry their own point. So if we look at uh, right away in verse one um, about Mount Zion, um, again, we have another depiction of a place, um, much like later on how, how Babylon is brought up. We, we have a, we have a location that, that stands for some pretty important imagery that I think um, brings into context what, what follows, both with 144,000 and also those um, descriptions of the redeemed later on, is understanding of, of how Mount Zion or the word Zion, um, you know, is used and what that points to. Um, uh, scholars right. you know, point to the fact that, um, you know, Z Zion, the place where, uh, David defeated is that pointing towards uh, Jerusalem, that that holy city, and and often when it's used, it, it's to depict the the place in which um, not only does God dwell, but also everything that God brings with Him, including His presence. Um, so right. 
when we equate Zion, we look at Jerusalem, but it's also the understanding that is the place where God dwelt. That was the holy city. That was where the temple was built. Um, so not only where um, God simply made his place, but it's also the place in which his salvation is then revealed. And he dwells amongst his people in the Jerusalem. So as we as we look then at, at seeing Mount Zion and stood the Lamb, it, it really makes that that connection that, okay, the lamb is, is God dwelling in the place where he is holy. Um, right. It, it's not a literal take that that's where he is standing. Um, oh, right. No, no, that, 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 that's right. That's right. But it does, it does refer to that location and it does, as you were saying, it refers to it in a particular way. And, and, and I think you're really right that it's it's important that we understand how this is a particular way of referring to this place because he he could have said right he could have said Jerusalem he could have said the holy city um, there's there's a couple other terms he could have used to describe that, that location symbolic significance as you were describing um, but he uses the term Mount Zion in particular and I and I think there's a few reasons why that's going to be key. Um, one of them, I think we're going to see more about mountains or, or hills later, which are going to have a, a really negative uh, connotation when it comes to comparing to Rome. So there's a, there's a little bit of a juxtaposition. We're going to see there's like Mount Zion on the one hand, and then the seven um, mounts of Rome, perhaps. Uh, and then I think the other thing, too, if you remember back in chapter 11, you had those two witnesses, uh, we, we, that section there, it said in verse 8, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. And that's a really interest. I mean, that's not just interesting. I mean, it's like a scandalous way of referring to Jerusalem right there. I mean, sure. calling it Sodom and Egypt. It's not even using the word uh, Jerusalem there. It's just, it just says the great city where the Lord was crucified. And so there's different ways of talking about Jerusalem there, there's a positive way, like here, Mount Zion, where it stands for God and his presence. But there's another way where it represents apostasy, slavery, immorality, and, and the rest. So we're seeing throughout throughout Revelation that Jerusalem is not just clearly like a good place or a bad place. It depends on what kind of aspect of Jerusalem we're talking about. Sure, and I think that, that poses a the, the really good parallel to how then we see the rest of Revelation play out of those who are uh, under this number of 144,000 and those who are not. You know, it, it shows right. both sides of the coin in one way. Yeah. Well, and, and so, and we have seen the number before, right? It was like, where was it? It was like, I think all the way back in chapter uh, seven, right? Seven. Where you had the, the, the 144,000 who were sealed, um, and there too, uh, we, we had this, it was this idea that the, the seal was a kind of um, protection um, from the, the, the tribulation that was, that was being poured out. These were the sealed who, um, and, we, and we talked about how too, it seemed to be a very, um, a, a very land-oriented description where if you, you kind of visualize in the map how it goes around from, from Judah in the south and over across the river to, to Reuben and then to Gad. Um, and then kind of coming down from the north then up Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, um, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, Benjamin. So um, the, the same sort of kind of land-oriented context seems to be here. The, the same kind of seal about, it says there, um, the sealing of God on their foreheads, that seems to be here. But that, that's just an interesting contrast, though, because we just talked about in the previous chapter, um, the the mark of the beast on the hand and the forehead. So now this kind of rings a little bit differently. Yeah, so I think, you know, it still represents, um, we talk about the, the church triumph and the church militant, and, you know, this 144,000, you know, still represent, um, you know, that, that church militant, those, those faithful survivors. I think, you know, this is one of the times where, you know, often the way different peoples and other faith bodies read Revelation tend to take this more as a literal group of people, rather than understanding that it is it is a number of kind of the totality of those who are the faithful, those who are, um, you know, held together. 
And I think that's important to understand as we go through 14 that, again, this 144,000 is not, you know, a literal group of, of those kind of people. But it is, it is, it is the, the faithful remnant who we will see later on um, when it comes to, like, verse 14, when we, when we hear about the harvest um, and, and the messages of the three angels. That, that, that's this group that is set apart um, as the ones who are then later uh, in the opening verses of 14, the one who are described as the right. redeemed. Right. No, that, that's right. And, and I like I like the term there you use, church militant, because we saw that how a, a thousand doesn't you know just mean a, a thousand, but it's like a it's a military number, right? It's mm-hmm. it's your, the way that you're starting to organize, um, you know, the, the, the troops who are being mustered for battle. And so when you have twelve thousand, I mean, and then you just keep adding that up, you're talking about this totality of God's people who are in a sense, ready for the conflict. And, and we saw that in the previous chapter, even it says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So, you know, here you've got these, uh, these beasts that are rising up. And the description, I think of that first beast there, it said, uh, where was that term there? I think, I think it said, yeah, in verse seven, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Right. So we're, we're totally talking about about war, about this kind of militant situation. I mean, y- you can't say it's literal, especially, you know, in the original context, because I don't even think there were 144,000 uh, Christians, you would say, at the time. Um, you know, there were, I mean, at least according to Acts, several thousand Christians who were there in Jerusalem, um, but but hardly 144,000. So this is like a spiritual perspective, uh, certainly, and um, in, in the midst of this, it's an, it's an interesting thing too to consider how this might have been like a literal thing on on the forehead, and because um, it, interesting, it doesn't say like just on the foreheads and, and on the hand, right? So it, it's not just he, he could have used like a per all just metaphor. So why not? But I, I think it's interesting that he's specifically mentioning the forehead, especially too, um, which w- which might be a little bit of a nod to perhaps. Um, you know, baptismal stuff, not that they were necessarily sprinkling at the time, but that, you know, you kind of get dunked head first, perhaps. <laughs> um, it also, I think I've read too, that it could refer to the old practice of um, the, uh, what are they called? Phylacteries, right? The little boxes that had oh, the little like yeah. bits of scroll, right? Which were actually on, on the, on the forehead and the hand, um, interestingly enough. Um, so those would have been pretty live contrasts with the the coins that that bore you know these 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 pagan rulers um who were saying blasphemous things as we've been reading yeah and again i i think you know it moves into under again understanding that like you said going back to verse 7 that they it was allowed to make war against the saints i i think it's important to remember that when these 144,000 come out, these are those who, who have been, who have walked through the warfare. They're the ones that have survived. And again, it's, it's not, um, I, I heard uh, uh, one pastor say once, it's not like literal war where you go in as a group of 20 and seven come out and it's by their own actions they survived. Which brings up the important point then that when it talks about the description of the redeemed towards the end of those verses we just read, right. um, it's important to understand that they come through not marked by their own actions, but by the Lamb who is introduced right away. Um, it is through through those actions. Um, it is verse uh, middle of verse 4, or second part of verse 4, it is those who yeah. follow the Lamb where he goes. Um, Right. Have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. Um, again, these 144, this 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 holy remnant that remains after uh, after this the spiritual war is there because of the faithfulness and the righteousness of Christ, not their own faithfulness. Well, and that's and that's an important thing for us to seize upon here. And let's let's try to get into that a little bit in a little bit of detail here. Um, so, okay, we, we can see that, that this is, you know, because of the, the faithfulness of Christ, we've had that description already that, um, you know, like, who are these, you know, and these have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. So we have this sort of imputed righteousness idea that, 
It's not like it's all them. Um, you know, like they are the ones who are praying, right? Their, their prayers are rising before the altar of God and God's the one who actually does the fighting, right? So we, we've seen those kinds of ideas, but the way this righteous, righteousness is described is kind of um, interesting, right? These who have not defiled themselves with women, right? I, I think that that translation, um, and, and I'm not even sure it's really the, the translation itself, but um, just putting it that way, it, it kind of sounds like negative towards uh, sex or maybe at least towards women and it's interesting that that's like the very first right description um like once you get into verse four of the of these guys um so what what do you make of the description though like even if this is you know crying on them like why is it described this way and what does that mean so i think uh for one it is it is not speaking out against um you know those who have um how can I put this? So the literal term of, of being a virgin, about talking about sex and the purity of sex. But I think what it talks about is it goes back to the imagery of uh, how the church is often referred to as Christ virgin bride. Um, Ephesians talks about them, uh, about that way, that um, that uh, that the, the bride of Christ, that she was washed and cleansed by him, that she is a virgin and holy to the Lord. So it's not so much, again, the, the literal side of, okay, it's those who have abstained from, um, from sex, but it is this idea that in Christ we are made that pure bride uh, of the church. We are, we are uh, Christ is our bridegroom. Um, again, it, it is super interesting language, uh, the way that it is presented, um, but it to encapsulate that idea that us being that pure bride for Christ and that bride follows the bridegroom um, lends to that image, imagery of, of these who, um, who have not been defiled, and because of Christ they are looked as pure and holy, are the ones who then follow Christ. Um, Dr. Brighton put right. it in a really good way. He said, uh, spiritually speaking, Paul says that those who have been converted through his ministry have been pledged to Christ as a virgin bride betrothed to her husband. Well, yeah, and I think that that kind of illustrates the idea a little bit, right? Whenever you talk about purity, the the idea is it's never just like, oh, well, this is just a pure thing. Isn't that great? But it, it's pure for some purpose right um in the case of uh you know for for instance in marriage right is like it's it's pure uh, there's this purity so that there can be then this offering of then the, the self the body right to um to the spouse um you get further on in the description uh, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits right well what's what's first fruits we're, we're talking about like you know for perhaps first fruits offerings right um there's this idea of you know the the land it has not yet been reaped at all it's virgin in a sense right and then we're going to take the the first things from it and offer it to god right as first fruits for god and the lamb so it's it's offering language throughout right um and even there in their mouth no lie was found i mean you think of back to isaiah um how isaiah is supposed to be rendering prophecy but how can he if he has a sinful mouth um, a mouth with with lies um falsehoods so all of this is this offering idea and so uh, how is it then that this makes sense as a description that these uh that these are these are pure for the sake of of offering right um and i think that the what you were just mentioning the kind of virgin bride idea i i think that totally fits in we see it elsewhere in revelation but but here you know it's interesting to consider what it means in the battle metaphor right the warrior metaphor uh, hold on to that thought uh, we'll, we'll I, I want to hear your thoughts on this too in a second here, but everybody hang on. We're looking at Revelation chapter 14 here on Nice Strong Word, and we'll be right back.
Hi, this is Pastor Mark Azil, the LCMS Director of Campus Ministry and the Chancellor of LCMSU, inviting you to join us right here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Student Union. If you can't make it, Student Union is always available as a podcast at kfuo.org. Learn more about LCMSU at lcmsu.org. And remember, college is tough. You need Jesus. We'll help. Wednesday afternoon at 2 on KFUO. Hello, this is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? Every week, you can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in, and may the intersection of word and work be busy on your corner. Our listeners and supporters are talking about Worldwide KFUO. I'm listening to you on my Kindle here in Great Falls, Virginia. I just want to thank you so much for the beautiful music, and I'm so thankful for you. God bless you and keep you in your good work. Thanks again. Bye-bye. To leave a message on the KFUO comment line, call 314-996-1542. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Revelation chapter 14 today. Just read this part about the 144,000 sealed. So much uh, so much metaphor, so much symbolism here. Um, and if you've got a question about all this, because there really are a lot of details, um, but there's a lot of depth to it, give us a call. You can call 1-800-730-2727. Or if you're in St. Louis, you can call 314-821-0850. Or you can always send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Also, don't want to forget to thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Check out their website at lhfmissions.org. And so today we are joined, um, as we were saying in the first half here, by Pastor Nate Ruback pastor at Grace Chapel Lutheran Church in Bellefonte Neighbors, Missouri. And and yeah, so we were just talking about how, okay, so what is this, you know, not defiled themselves with women, right? Like, you know, what is it, is it, you know, defiling yourself with the women? Is this, is this bad? Okay. So, so there, here's the one side. Um, and pastor Ruback mentioned this already. There is the kind of, um, purity metaphor that we see later with the, with the bride of Christ idea. But I think there's one here too, in, in the, in the warrior uh, metaphor here because this doesn't i mean it seems to be kind of focused on the on the warrior part and we're going to get to kind of more of the bride stuff um later but so consider this uh one of the big things that was going on at the time was that you had these um these zealots who were taking nazarite vows um at least uh, temporarily um some of them were taking apparently lifelong permanent Nazarite vows, but they would take these Nazarite vows as a way of purifying themselves. Um, and what you would do at the end of your uh, Nazarite period, or, or perhaps um, every so often, you, you would take the hair like Samson, right? Think of Sam Samson, the Nazarite, um, and you would cut it off and you would burn it as an offering, right? So you, you do this, this purification to make an offering. And they would do this as they were getting ready to, to go into battle, right? So this is really interesting because in that Old Testament way of kind of getting ready to to worship or render an offering, right, you would abstain from sexual intercourse, at least for a certain period of time leading up to whatever the offering was. And if these people here, the 144,000, are metaphorically an army, well, the army at the time um, was was all men. The, the, the men were the ones fighting for their their wives and their children. So, of course, it's just natural that if you're, they're abstaining from intercourse, they're abstaining from intercourse with women. I mean, we're talking about like the, the this worldview of, you know, the Judeo-Christian, you know, morals and ethics, right? So I think it's not saying that, you know, virgins are better or that women are, are icky, but the idea is, you know, these warriors here are devoting themselves to God um, so that they would render true worship and a a right a right offering as they prepare um, in the midst of, of this of this battle. But um, just like our our guest here was saying here, Pastor Ruback, you were just saying like what's interesting is how the focus is not on 
how much fighting they're doing, right? Unlike the zealots who are just so focused on like, oh, they got to like fight and they got to, you know, the guerrilla tactics or whatever. The focus here is like on, on music. I mean, it's, it's on the, the sound of the harpist. It's about learning the song. It's about singing with the four creatures. Uh, this army, it seems like their primary purpose is to sing praises to God. Yeah, and what's interesting is, is, is as that focus is different, what we don't see is the, out, the outside influence of others. So in the break, I, I was thinking about what else, you know, does, does, does purity bring to mind? And it's, this outs- and it's this understanding, especially for us as Christians now, the outside influences that affect us. You know, it, it's, it's the outside pull of the world that tries to change our focus off of, of what Christ calls us to be, to be the way, of, to rather follow the way of the world. So in, in that same regard, as, as they are preparing for war, as they are making themselves pure, as they are dedicating um, their lives to what is to come, in that dedication is, is also stepping aside and not being overcome by outside influences, um, by the... Um, by by liars or or lies right. that are told or or alternative influences and thoughts, um, it is right. really a, a it's a stark comparison that that their preparation and their minds are completely on um, the way of God or the Lamb as it's described uh, in those opening verses. Yeah, that's, no, that's a really good point too, and I think that as as we go forward and, and we. We get to the contrast between the bride on the one hand, the bride of Christ, and and, and then the the whore of Babylon, as as a, it's traditionally translated, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, who by the way, right? It, you consider is is making herself um, impure with with men, right? So it's not like it's like one or the other necessarily, um, but that idea of adultery, right? It represents apostasy. It represents adulterating. You can use that term, the religion. Right, and we saw that again and again in Isaiah, how um, adultery was a metaphor for being unfaithful to God, um, mm-hmm. and for letting, as you were saying, those outside influences. In this case, the religious systems of all the pagans around them um, being combined in, in some kind of syncretism with their own religion. So, so yeah, I, I think you're right that there is um, there, there's a lot to this that that really does actually overlap a lot. And um, it, it's, it's not really about uh, like sex or, or, or women like per se at, at all really here. This is all um, these, these metaphors for not compromising the faith um, for th- this sort of uh, dedication, dedication and devotion to God, um, this whole like preparing for battle um, and the rest of it. So like, like I think you said at the top of the hour, we could spend the whole time just talking about the first <laughs> yeah. five well, verses I think it's here. In, important. You said, you said the word metaphor, and I think you know, that's the way it needs yeah. to be read and understood. Yeah. Um, it's very easy in these verses to take it as literal, but they're not. It's, yeah. it's metaphorical writing that represents something bigger or something uh, more complete. And I, as, right. we, as you move through all of Revelation, that's something very important to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, and of course, even even the singing, though, of course, we do we do literally sing, and that's an important thing. Um, but I mean, just uh, I think I think singing, getting to the idea of um, the life of worship, but then also, as we saw earlier, um, singing as celebration as a metaphor for Sabbath rest, right? That what what did what it what did Israel do when they made it across the Red Sea, right? Consider, right? They they were metaphorically this army that was against Pharaoh's army. They didn't do any of the fighting. It was all the angel of the Lord, right? Um, they get over to the other side, the battle having been won just by God Himself, um, totally. Um, and what they do, they sing and they dance, right? So the idea of that seventh day new creation, celebration and rest, um, you know, we we have in many important ways this this perpetual seventh day rest in Christ, in the whole life of faith. Uh, it's not just like a once a week thing or a certain day of the week thing. Um, so, I mean, a lot, lots of, um, lot, lots of deep, deep symbolism here, but we've, we've got to make it at least to verse 13. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, just, first five verses are very good, but all right. Here we go, and this introduces uh, yet another city description. What we mentioned at the top of the hour, Babylon. So this is this is key because this is where it pops up here, and we got to really take stock of what this means. All right, so here's 
verse 6 to verse 13. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Just a uh, really, of course, powerful a uh, couple of verses right there at the end. I mean, they. It, it seems like there, there kind of seems to be these moments where they kind of break the the fourth wall. I think, right? We saw this back in in chapter uh, chapter thirteen. You know, here is a call for uh, the endurance of faith, endurance and faith of the saints, and here the same thing here or very very similar. His call for the endurance of the saints. Um, you know, I, I feel like this is this is that kind of fourth wall breaking where it's like. Hey, th this isn't just kind of the angels who are saying this um, in my vision here, but this, this, you know, take heed, everyone reading this, wh whenever you happen to be reading this, right? Whether it's you, you get this letter that I send out, you know, a week from now or a thousand years from now, right? This is a call for endurance um, and, and the emphasis on rest, right? It, it's, it's like what we were just saying before about like the rest of the singing, right? There is no rest for those who worship the beast, but there is rest, a blessed rest even in the midst of death, for those who follow Christ. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, that when I was reading through these verses, I, I couldn't help but think about, obviously, the time that we're in right now, um, with everything going on, with people getting sick, people dying, losing their jobs, we're, you know, our normal, as you stated, has been flipped upside down. Um, you know, and I, I think this is one of those points that that it's very easy to say, you know, or think, well, where do we fall in this? Do we fall? Are we in this moment of rest now? Or when does this blessed rest come? Is this a moment in which God is um, punishing us? Or is this a time where we're in the midst of the warfare? Um, you know, and I think for we use this this categorization of the remnant of, of that 144,000 of the faithful, you know, they are going to be in the midst of the war. They're going to be in the midst of the torment. And while it may not seem restful, the the hope is, is that those who die in the Lord will receive a blessed rest beyond any momentary rest we may have in the midst of, of the battle um, that we're all in the midst of right now. It, it, it just really stood out at me that this is one of those verses in the midst of what we're dealing with today and on, on April 21st, 2020, really speaks that for us, as difficult as today is, that blessed rest is promised for all of us. Right. Yeah, and, and it's really, a little it's bit, really but... something to take... Yeah, no, no, no. But it, it's it's good to to stop and and to consider that because I, I think that um, in, in in this situation that we find ourselves in, I think we're all wanting wanting relief. We're all wanting a break, right? It's like, can, can we can we please, you know, be done with this? You know, this is where everyone's kind of you know questioning. You know, is is the medicine worse um, than the disease, right? Um, and, and it's in the midst of that where we're, there's this real hunger um, for, in the biblical language, for rest, right? Um, and this idea that, 
there actually is a rest for those of the faith in the midst of these circumstances, you know, and, and, and that really, you know, that, that can, I don't know what, that, that can ring hollow or sound cliche, but I mean, consider, you know, what this might've been referring to in the original context. And we've been talking about how this seems to correspond really well with everything going on around AD 70, right? Like around the time when the temple was destroyed, when the, the Romans came and killed so many people, I mean, that's what that's what the message here. He's saying here, hey, um, b- be bold, have endurance um, in the midst of this that you may have rest. You know, because think about that. Right at this time, you had um, these these leaders um, who were, you know, I think of like Herod Agrippa the um, second. He would have been the the king who kind of had, even if not land holdings around Jerusalem, at least kind of jurisdiction over the temple. Uh, and what and what were these guys saying, right? This guy and um, and, and some of the other Ju- Judean authorities, Jerusalem authorities, right, who were appointed by the Romans at this time. Oh, guys, you know, hey, you know, uh, come on. Yes, we've suffered great injustices and this violence, and, and yes, but but you know, p- hold on, have peace. Don't don't fight. Um, let's let's work with the Romans, right? Like really, it'll work out better for us. And you know, and maybe if we if we cooperate, you know, we will eventually be free, right? I mean, so I mean, everything they're talking about, right, is about you know this this earthly rest, right? You know, hey, if we kind of like play by their rules, if we go along, you know, yeah. go along to get along, right? Then then I we can have some kind of rest here. for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and of course, then the zealots who are like, well, the only way we're going to have rest is if we fight these guys. We got we got to kick them out. We won't have rest until they're gone. So um, y- you had just two two very different takes on how we can get rest. And then this is so bold to say, hey, actually, you know what? Don't go along with any of these guys. Just stand up for the faith, no matter what, no matter what they do to you. That's your rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. You know, going back, I think one of the other points, not to kind of backshift gears a little bit, is uh, you brought up earlier is this mention of Babylon. Um, Yeah. And and you talk about those enemies, uh, whether it's the zealots and things that are fighting, is is again this 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 name of Babylon the Great. Um, First time it appears in Revelation, and it's a pretty Mm -hmm. um, you know it's a pretty pointed um, pointed word. I mean, it's pretty pointed. Um, section again against whom they're fighting Um, verse 8 another angel the second followed saying fallen fallen is Babylon the great Um, and I think it's important to to know that when Babylon is used especially in this way it's symbolizing um, or it's speaking against every evil enemy of Christ here on earth so we talk about those who they're fighting against and, and this is kind of a use of language to really point out and to be specific that you're fighting against every opposition to Christ's church. Right. Yeah, no, and that's, um, so yeah, we, we should really try to focus on this. Okay, so I, I was, in some ways, I was kind of jumping the gun, you know, talking about the situation in Jerusalem, right? But no, hang on, who's to say we're talking about Jerusalem? It says Babylon. <laughs> so what's going on? Uh I think there's a few things going on. I think, as you said, Babylon, in a certain sense, seems to represent kind of the collective totality of the en- of, of the enemies of God, right? Like all of them. Um, when we when we saw earlier, uh, you had the first beast in in chapter thirteen, right? Um, there in verse two, this this first beast who rises up from the sea. It says uh, the beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And that's interesting because that goes, like we said last time, it goes back to Daniel's vision in chapter 7. And that's reverse order um, for what I would say what corresponds to the Macedonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire. Because in the vision that Daniel saw in chapter 7 of his book, the lion is what represents Babylon, I think that's pretty key. And he goes in reverse order here in chapter 13, which has the effect of accentuating the lion, which symbolizes Babylon at the time. So this this first beast has this very, I mean, a very strong Babylonian symbol attached to it. And we've seen the lion actually come up 
a few in a, a few different places, um, which is which is pretty interesting. I mean, you had the giant angel, who we said uh, seemed to be possibly symbolizing the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, you had the 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 lions of the of the what was it the sixth trumpet blast, um, who uh, looked like an army of lions on a certain level. Um, so there's there's all these sorts of kind of things that seem to be pointing to Babylon as as kind of collectively all the enemies of God, no matter where they're from, whether they're whether they're Edomians, whether they're Romans, whether they're the people who are in Jerusalem. Um, but I think that that's actually the bit where it gets pretty interesting because it says right there in chapter 14, not just Babylon, but Babylon the Great. And we just read it um, right before the break. When was the last time that we had something described as the great? Um, well, that's right. It was back in chapter 11 when it said here, the great city. We're talking about the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt where their Lord was crucified. So it seems like Babylon is a general term for just the enemies of God. But if there's going to be any place where it specifically refers to, it's going to be referring to Jerusalem in its apostasy. Yeah, I, I think, it, yeah, again, you have this, like we spoke about earlier, it, it's, I mean, for, for John, um, Rome was historically the enemy of the church, right? So again, we have this um, this focus again on Jerusalem, Zion, as it's, as it's spoken about at the beginning of the chapter, um, right. where there is this, this split difference of, of, of those, uh, like you said, of their apostasy, of their, of their, break from God, their, their lawless life, uh, their faithless life. Um, and it's interesting that within that verse, 8, um, it, it, while it says Babylon the Great, the words that, that precede that are fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That as strong as Babylon right. was, as strong as Rome was, um, there, is, there is a strength, there is a point in which that strength diminishes, where it isn't strong enough where all of that, um, the wine of passion, the sexual immorality, the desires of, of human flesh uh, crumble under, uh, under faith, under endurance of faith, um, under the right. promises of the Lamb. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's important to know, too, that as, as great as Babylon is and as, as strong as some of that Im- imagery is constantly pointing to that, um, it's important to know that that it will fall. It will crumble. There, there will not be that strength and that power um, in the end. Right. Well, yeah, and, and certainly, um, you know, and, and, and eventually, right, um, the Roman Empire <laughs> seems to, uh, as you said, kind of crumble. There, there isn't sort of a, a big dramatic end to the Roman Empire, but much later there is a kind of just a slow, steady deterioration. Um, and, and, you know, and Rome's a part of that, um, you know, as you were saying, you know, kind of babbling God. But um, interesting to consider how specifically it does uh, perhaps refer to Jerusalem in particular uh, in Revelation, how you have the so-called whore of Babylon, um, who, who, I mean, who is she with? Well, she's with the beast, right? So if you, if you see that as Jerusalem, right, Jerusalem, which with Rome allied itself with the Gentile enemies of God. Um, that's, that's pretty provocative here because here we have a, then a description that says fallen, fallen is Jerusalem, at least the apostate Jerusalem, because in the situation we've been, the temple was actually about to be destroyed. The city was about to be destroyed. All the zealots, um, you know, with their, their long Nazarite vow hair, um, all of the collaborators who are saying, "Oh no, it's okay. Let's let's make peace with Rome, and we'll we'll deal with you know their money and their Caesars and all the rest." Um, both those groups, their ways of achieving rest were not going to work. Um, rather, it was going to be judgment that God had. So, I mean, I think there's a couple levels there, but uh, very very striking that whether whether you kind of take it as like you know, hey, even the biggest baddest enemies of God will be defeated, or um, as, as I'm suggesting, uh, kind of all the alternative ways to achieve peace that are tempting for people of faith to go along with, whether it's the way of the zealots or the way of the uh, you know collaborators. And I think that we 
we kind of have that in our own day and situation too, where we look at, you know, other Christians and there's, there's some who kind of just want to go along with the flow, right? Cause Hey, it'll work out better for us. And there's the ones who, you know, are kind of the real hotheads who say like, Oh, we're going to take this over. Right. And we're going to fight the power and the rest of it. But there is this, this third way that just waits for God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, like you said, I, I think that that comes out to play um, very much in our time. Um, those who often want to be the, uh, oh, I'm trying to, I'm struggling for the word, those kind of barn burners, those ones that, um, you know, the only way that Christianity is going to um, succeed or spread is if we, you know, take down in any means necessary those who are heathen. You know, I think we see that right. at times with with um, Christian or pseudo-Christian churches who are out protesting things and making connections that um, certainly are not helpful, biblical, um, or quite frankly, Christian at all. Um, well, no, yeah, it's it's it's, it's certainly it's certainly yeah. fair, right? But but taking the emphasis in the end away from from Christ, who is the one who actually does the conquering, right? And what sure. his conquering consists of, and pointing us back to his cross. If he conquers by by letting himself be killed, right? You know, how does the church conquer then, right? I mean, think about that. Um, we're running out of time here. Let me just read the rest of the chapter, and maybe we have uh, time for a closing remark here. But let's pick it up here at verse 14 now. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called the loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. Uh, Now, uh, a lot could be said there too, right? But I mean, I think it's what's clear is that you got that language of the, the wine of God's wrath. Um, and that blood of grapes, perhaps met- metaphorically symbolizing actual uh, blood. There, there was judgment, of course. Um, you know, Josephus accounts that after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, that there was just blood from the city that just went out. Um, you know, sixteen hundred stadia. I mean, that's uh, you know, like I mean, like hundreds of feet, right? Um, hyperbole, perhaps, but uh, certainly an image of God's wrath. But just kind of thirty seconds here, just. In the midst of this image of wrath, you know, where, where is the comfort as a Christian in this? Well, I think the comfort comes in the fact of looking at that first sickle that comes through, and while everything is harvested, we don't we do know the promise that promise that but that which is deemed worthy is, is what is gathered and brought into the barn, and the chaff and the, the weeds are what's thrown away. And I think the promise for us goes back all the way to the beginning of the chapter that those those 144,000, those faithful who clung to Christ, are amongst those who will be gathered uh, into the barn, those who will be gathered into Christ. And it simply shows no. the destruction of the rest. Yeah, that's right. No, no matter what, we have our rest in Christ, which cannot be touched. That's, that's what we celebrate in Easter. Thank you so much, brother. Good having you with us. God bless much. the rest of your Easter you season. Too. Thank you, everybody. That was Pastor Nate Ruback, pastor at Grace Chapel Lutheran Church, Bellafonte Neighbors, Missouri. Moving on to Revelation chapter 15. Until then, everybody, I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Peace. You've been listening to Thy Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.